Yo, what's going on, y'all? It's Cone back here again today with another video. And today, we're doing another episode of NBA Hot Takes. As usual, went to Twitter, asked you for your hottest NBA takes, especially now that a majority of the main part of the offseason is over. We've been through the draft. Most free agents are signed. We're really getting into the thick of the summer. So I want to know your NBA opinions. And y'all gave me some great ones. I went ahead and picked out some of my favorites. I'm going to go ahead and react to them in this video and tell you whether I agree or disagree. I want to hear your opinions as well down below in the comments and some of your own hot takes. It's always fun to do this when everybody's kind of optimistic, trying to make predictions about the moves we saw this summer. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, also, I'm in a hotel. I'm in Vegas right now for Summer League. So this will be the background for the next couple of videos. If they're a bit sporadic, that's why as well. Hopefully, the lighting audio all looks and sounds good. I think it should be all right. But that being said, leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. And once again, let's get into some takes. First take comes from Herbert, who says that Isaiah Hartenstein's contract will go down similarly to Bismack. Biombo. First of all, shout Thunder legend Bismack Biombo, but I couldn't disagree more with this take. And it's not just because I'm a Thunder fan. Isaiah Hartenstein has been a productive and impactful player for a lot of different teams throughout his career already going into Oklahoma City. If you remember with Bismack Biombo, he bounced around a little bit, landed in Toronto and had that really good playoff run in 2016. And that's when he got paid that summer that everybody did. It was him. It was Mozgov. It was an older Luol Deng. That was the summer of throwing out ridiculous contracts. But Isaiah Hartenstein was just one of the most impactful players for a Knicks team that almost made it to the conference finals. Again, he's been doing this a lot. Advanced metrics love him. And if you just look at the difference, Bismack Biombo is like, you know, an athletic defensive big who kind of just got hot at the right moment while Isaiah Hartenstein does a lot more. He's a lot more of a versatile player. So I don't agree with this at all. Maybe it goes down as a bit of an overpay. I guess you could try to make that argument. But again, I've went off on this a number of times, basically thinking that Isaiah Hartenstein is a perfect fit for the Thunder. I think he's going to revolutionize everything with his passing ability, his screening, his outside shot does exist. We've seen it multiple points throughout his career, which is also a big difference between him and Biombo. He has way more ways to be effective in the offense. Yeah, I don't think this is anything close to being similar. I've seen a couple of people say this. I just don't see the vision whatsoever. Maybe it's because I'm a Thunder fan, but I think there is a literal 1% chance that the Isaiah Hartenstein contract goes down anything close to what Bismack Biombos did as one of the biggest overpays in recent NBA history. Then we've got one from Tyler who says that the Spurs will have 40 plus wins next season. I even think they could meet up with OKC for a first round playoff series. This one's interesting. I'm seeing a lot of people get really in on the Spurs, especially after the Chris Paul signing. They brought in Harrison Barnes through the DeMar DeRozan trade. Of course, year two Wemby is going to be insane. I mean, year one Wemby was one of the greatest rookie seasons we've ever seen. He got a five by five, nearly had two on back to back nights. And then you're seeing some clips from him out of FIBA, and it literally doesn't feel like anything he does should be possible. He almost won Defensive Player of the Year as a rookie on a terrible defensive team. If he takes the jump, I think he can, which probably will make him a bona fide top 10 player as early as this season. Chris Paul, I think, will have a big effect on that if he can kind of refine some of the magic he's had in some other destinations before Golden State. If Harrison Barnes can contribute. If some of those other young guys, like a Devin Vassell and a Keldon Johnson and Jeremy Sohan, a lot of these guys can make some jumps in their own right. And, you know, maybe they make a couple more acquisitions. The offseason isn't over. I think this is possible. But to me, for them to win 40 plus wins in this stacked Western Conference that has probably 13, if not 14 teams that I think could be relatively competitive next season. The only team I don't think is going to be is Portland and probably not Utah. But if they keep Lowry, there's a chance they're going to be pretty close in a lot of the games, even though they're going to be one of the worst teams. They're definitely not a pushover. So it's going to be hard to try and make that happen. I mean, maybe Wemby just becomes like, top five in the world as early as next season. And then boom, yeah, they are a playoff team. I just think it's a little bit too early. I wouldn't be shocked if they were right there in the play-in race for pretty much the entire season, or even if they made it somehow. But I think them winning 40 plus wins, it just feels a little bit too early if you ask me, especially when you take a look at the fact that they were like right around 20 last season. Next take comes from Diego, who says that Franz Wagner's contract is extremely deserved and the Magic are now in prime position for a consolidation trade. If you didn't know, Franz Wagner got a big time contract extension this offseason, five years, $224 million. A lot of young players did like Cade Cunningham did as well. And similar with Cade Cunningham, a lot of people said that this was an insane contract, that the Magic way overpaid to give this money to Franz and that it's ultimately going to be looked back on as a mistake. And I even saw some people say one of the worst contracts ever. 
that feels crazy to me. Franz Wagner is still really young. He just had his third season and he was really good. Like the big thing that jumps out is his three point percentage took a massive dip, eight percentage points down from 36 to 28% this past season. Yet his field goal percentage remained just about the same. And I have pretty strong confidence his jumper will come back. He's really solid finishing inside. He's an amazing defender. He's kind of a Swiss army knife, a perfect second guy to have next to Paolo Bancaro. Plus $40 million roughly for a guy who is a rising young player on your team that needs nearly just won a playoff series is one of your core guys is not that crazy in today's NBA. I think people are still kind of locked in with the old contracts where 40 mil was around like the max you could give a player. There are guys getting up to $60 million now. There are guys that are pretty soon going to be getting 70, even up to $80 million if you're like on a super, super max. So this isn't that crazy. And I personally believe that Franz Wagner has all the upside in the world. And that if anything, this could be a steal of a contract one day. I just don't think people realize how much value he brings to the magic. I'm a strong believer. He's going to bounce back with that three point shooting and he just affects the game all over the court. Like, EPM, which is an all-around advanced stat that I think is one of the better ones, has Franz Wagner as a 94th percentile NBA player. I mean, they said he's as impactful this past season as like Jamal Murray, Tyrese Maxey, right around that range. And I don't think he's better than those players, but he does provide a massive impact for Orlando. And if they want to continue to grow this thing, you got to pay one of your best young guys. And in terms of the consolidation trade, I also agree. The Magic feels set up with some of their draft picks. They still have their assets and some interesting young players. Otherwise, like a Jed Howard or an Anthony black they could use in a deal if a star does become available i think there's a real chance that when a big name is next on the market orlando is one of the top teams in the running now we've got a take from sabonis season who says that sacramento will be a title contender this is of course coming off the heels of the demar Derozan trade i gave my full thoughts on that in a recent video if you want to go hear me talk about that a bit more but to quickly summarize the fit is a little bit weird in my eyes. I don't think this should be the only move that Sacramento makes this offseason. I think there's some other stuff they could do. I know there's rumors about them being interested in like a Kyle Kuzma. I think Jeremy Grant would be a fun addition to this team as well. Just adding some more defensive presence to this squad in that front court in general would be good because I really worry about the defense. But offensively, he definitely gives them a bit of a boost. He's going to be better than Harrison Barnes. They got better in terms of the talent. So I don't love the fit necessarily, but I think it's a trade that made sense. And ultimately, it was a good one for the frame franchise, but does it make them a title contender? No, I don't think adding DeMar DeRozan to a team that just missed the playoffs is enough to make you a title contender in 2024. When you've got teams up towards the top, like OKC and Dallas and Minnesota, it's going to be tough. Denver, even though they lost KCP is still going to be amazing with Jokic. I just think there are still some question marks and some flaws in terms of the depth, the defense with this Kings team. How is DeRozan going to fit in? Because I think that's also going to take some time. It's going to be hard to make the Sacramento team into a title contender. I think they're better, and I wouldn't be shocked at all if they're back in the playoffs next year. Even if they ended up as like a top five or six seed, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. But a title contender, I just don't see it. When you've got teams all throughout the NBA that are stacked in both sides of the ball, it just doesn't feel likely. Next take comes from Quart, who says that the Lakers will miss the playoffs completely. And same goes for the Suns. Now, both these squads were in the playoffs last season. They had championship aspirations, lost in the first round, and going into this year still have those championship goals. I mean, when you have LeBron and ADU in the Lakers case and you went all in, like more all in than I thought was possible for the big three of Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Phoenix's case, you've got to have those goals. Now it is though a stacked Western Conference. When you take a look at the teams, I think that are locks, I would say Thunder, Nuggets, Timberwolves, Mavericks are probably locked in barring major injuries. And that of course goes for all of these teams. I feel like the Grizzlies are probably a lock. They were a two seed last time we saw them. I think when healthy with Ja, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson, all those guys, they will again be a pretty firm playoff team. And then you take a look at squads outside of them. Like the Clippers were just a four seed. I know they lost Paul George, but it still feels like they're a good squad, especially if Kawhi stays healthy. You've got the Pelicans who added DeJounte Murray. You've got the Kings who added DeRozan. Warriors have made some interesting moves. The Rockets feel like they're going to come up the standings a bit or at least be better than they were last season. You know, we talked about the Spurs earlier. I don't think they're going to win 40 games, but they're a tough team to beat on any given night. It's loaded out there. You have to really lock in every night and any one false move or a big time injury could really bring you down the standings. And on paper, I think the Lakers and Suns have done some things I liked this off season. In the Suns case, they went ahead and brought in Mike Budenholzer, who I do like as a coach. He's not like the best coach in the league, but I'm excited to see what he can do with that team. They added Monte Morris, who I really like as a guard off the bench, brought in Mason Plumley, drafted Ryan Dunn. Those are moves that I think are pretty good. And that big three, when they play are pretty scary. They 
they can do some really good things. Now, it did result in them being just a six seed last season, but they dealt with a lot of injuries if they can stay healthier. I think there's a world where the Suns, after building some chemistry, are a pretty good team out in the Western Conference next season. Now, with them, of course, the X factor is can they stay healthy? And with KD, Booker, and Beal on the roster, that feels like a big question mark. As for the Lakers, they got a pretty healthy year last season out of LeBron and AD, who have been pretty injury prone over the past few seasons. I'm not sure if that's going to happen again. And they've made no moves outside of just, you know, drafting Dalton Connect, Bronny James, adding JJ Redick as a head coach, who I am excited to see what he can do with this team. I think he's going to be a better fit than Darvin Ham was. But this is kind of just the same roster, and it feels like a lot of teams at West got better. So I don't really know how I feel about either of these squads. If I were to pick today, I would say they both would make the playoffs because I'm not going to bet against just the top end talent that they have, but it's not a guarantee. Now, I'd be pretty surprised if neither one of them made the playoffs. I think at least one will. And again, I do expect both to make the playoffs. But if you said, hey, by the end of this season, either the Lakers or the Suns will not be in the playoffs it wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world. And that feels kind of crazy, but I think it's true. Now we've got a take from Rocket who says that if the Warriors get Steph another star, they're right back in the title contention. A fifth ring for Steph gets him to top five all-time convos. I'm not a big all-time rankings guy. I'm not a big player rankings guy in general, but sure, I guess if Steph gets a fifth ring, he's finals MVP, especially at this age, I guess you add the longevity into it. Yeah, I'll throw Steph top five all-time, or at least he's in those conversations. Uh, but for the Warriors adding another star and getting right back into title contention, it depends what you mean by a star. Now, Lowry Market is the big name out there that I've seen circulating, and I don't think Lowry is going to be enough for them to get up to championship contention. I think this team is like a fringe playoff squad at the moment. Steph would have to go insane to get them any higher than I think a playing team, which he's capable of. But I just don't really see it for the Warriors at the moment. I think there's a lot of holes on the roster. They're relatively young. And like Podjemski's a really good young player. I loved what he did last season. Trace Jackson Davis. Jonathan Kuminga really broke out during a part of last season. It was still a build up and down, you know, a little bit inconsistent. But I like Kuminga's potential. They do still have Draymond, Steph Curry. Like this is a team I think will be competitive. But I don't think Lowry Markkinen turns you into a team that's better than the stack squads in the Western Conference. I don't think you would beat the Boston Celtics in a series. It just feels like they've got a couple of holes. And also, like, their top guys in Steph and Draymond are getting up there in age. They're regressing a little bit. Now, Steph's still ridiculous. Don't take this as me saying Steph is washed. But I think he is regressing a little bit. And with the Western Conference, once again, I've said a million times this video being so stacked, I think they need a little bit more than that. Now, if they grab, like, a superstar, sure. But I just don't think one of those players are going to become available. And anything less than, like, a high-end all-star, you know, fringe superstar level player feels like it's not going to be enough for them. Finally, we've got a take from Bud who says that the Clippers will have a better roster and record at the trade deadline than the 76ers. Uh, obviously, Paul George comes over from the Clippers to the Sixers, so that's the comparison here. You've got Max, you've got a beat over there, a big three that I'm a big fan of. I just made a whole video recently about how much I like what the Sixers have done this offseason. And as for the Clippers, I don't love what's going on over there. I think they've made some moves to keep themselves competitive and be better than they would have been otherwise. But I just don't think adding like Derek Jones Jr., Mo Bamba, Chris Dunn, if that signing trade ever gets finished, we've been waiting on that for like a week, it feels like. I just don't think that's enough that's going to get you better in the standings than the Sixers who play in a weaker Eastern Conference. I mean, if they deal with big injuries, which is possible with that roster, then sure. But say both teams were fully healthy, I'm taking the Sixers for sure to have a better record going to the trade deadline. I think their roster is just straight up better right now, unless the Clippers make some kind of big move that's not going to change. So yeah, I mean, the Clippers offseason overall outside of like losing PG, like the, the backup moves they made were fine but it's not going to make you anywhere near as good as that Sixers team, which I believe is a real threatening force in the Eastern Conference. But yeah, with all that being said, I appreciate you all watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Uh, let me know again what you thought of these takes. Drop some of yours down below in the comments. Videos will be a little bit sporadic while I'm here in Summer League, but hopefully I should be getting one up at least every other day. Might be every other two days, depending on where I'm at with doing some other content. I'm doing some cool stuff out here that I'll definitely try and turn into like a YouTube video or like a YouTube short. Of course, I'll post about it on Twitter. That's where I continuously and keeping you all updated. So make sure to go follow me on there if you want everything that I'm up to. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate you all watching. I'll see you all later. Real one, stay back.